The silence is grey. I hear a faint drumming or swishing, a peculiar noise which is within me. Am I dead? I feel pain. My head throbs and my neck, my arm, hand. I am broken, but alive. The sound inside me is my breathing. How alive? I lift my right hand and touch my cheek, my throat, my forehead. A whisper, a croak, a humming from my throat. It is me trying to speak. Where am I? Alone, in an enclosed grey space laid flat. My head and body ache as I try to rise. No, I sink back and I must sleep. There is light and a voice. I am dreaming. My shoulder moves roughly. A man calls my name. I know this man. It is... My eyes open and I flinch as Captain Arscombe's face is close to mine. Where am I? You were attacked, but you are saved. That much I know, but how was I saved, and how did I get here? Where is this place? I do not recognize the chamber. Arscombe grabs my arm and helps me to sit. I shake my head, then stop quickly as pain punches sharply in a space behind my eyes. I am on a hard wooden bed with no bolsters or linens, clothed only in hose and shirt. My other clothes and shoes are on a rough stone floor. My legs are uninjured and my right arm moves with freedom. My left arm will not move. Ah! My breath catches. It is my left wrist that is swollen and hangs oddly. There is dried blood on the sleeve of my shirt and I see that this has spread to my chest. I repeat my last question. You are in Sir Francis' house in Seething Lane. I am ordered to take you to him. Sir Francis has returned from France? Yes, two nights past. He takes my arm, and I stand. My legs bear me, if a little unsteadily. My vision is blurred, and I close my eyes. I open them and stagger as the room swims. Arscombe clutches me and I breathe deeply to regain my balance. I step gently, then with more purpose as we walk slowly towards the door. The door opens and two guards stiffen as we exit. We tread down a narrow passage, up a flight of stairs, and then to a lighter area with a wider passage and polished wooden floor. Arscombe knocks on a door, opens it, and gestures for me to enter. Walsingham is slouched in a chair behind a table with a thin dagger in his hand. He appears to be trimming his fingernails. Dr. Constable, you are in a poor state. Ah, yes, forgive my appearance, Mr. Secretary. I was attacked. Indeed. Your wounds have not been dressed, but you have been examined. Your wrist is damaged and your head will be sore, but I am told that you have no mortal injury. My senses are not fully recovered, but I detect a coldness in his manner. Why have I not been treated with more care and comfort? A bare room, hard bed, wounds undressed, no refreshment offered? Something is amiss a wrongness in the air. How was I saved? You were followed. It is fortunate for you that the captain was close by with another man. Why was I followed? He ignores my question and asks one in return. Why have you visited the house of Sir George Morton? I... I heard of his great venture with Captain General Hawkins and... It stirred my interest in the art of ship navigation again. 
It is somewhat coincidental that your interest was revived a day or two after your consideration of the chart and coded messages at Barn Elms. That is all it is, a coincidence. Is it also a matter of accident that Dr. D's library was burned shortly after your first visit for many years? I do not think that was ill fortune. I believe it was planned because word had reached the conspirators about the search for Millen. Dr. Fox and Captain Arskham agree with me on this. He is silent for a while and continues to trim his fingernails. He says, Why do you think you were brought to me at Whitehall that night? Was it because I suspected some hidden talent in you for solving ciphers? Your expertise in astrology, perhaps? Or was it a chance plucking of a name out of thin air? You stated that it was my association with Dr. D. Ah, yes, I remember. When you arrived that night, you will have seen the corrupted bodies of three men, freshly killed for their treason. One of those men cried out your name through the agony of cracking limbs. Godfrey Baskin. I knew him a little, but many years passed. Why would he utter my name? Why indeed, Dr. Constable? I... I can only think that he was being questioned about his knowledge of astrologers. Then... Then you connected him with the natal chart in the box and suspected me. Very good, Dr. Constable. You have clear insights despite your sore head. But you must know I am not one of the conspirators. I solved the cipher. I gave the names of Kelly and Millen. Ah, the cipher. A quick solution for an amateur. And both of those men are known to you. Knowing is not conspiring. There will be many innocents who have acquaintances with those convicted of crimes. Some of what you say rings true, and you are fortunate that Dr. Fox has a liking for you. Also, the captain speaks in your favor. Yet, I am troubled by this connection with Sir George Morton. It is untimely and too sudden. Does Master Miles suspect me? He is... undecided. As am I. My interest in Sir George's great venture to the New Lands is genuine and true. I was reminded of my work on the mathematics of navigation at my summons to Whitehall that night. I quickly became absorbed in study to find a practical instrument that will improve navigation and assist in the rendezvous of the fleet. He listens carefully and bows his head, bidding me to continue. I outline the difficulty of taking accurate readings looking to the top of a crosshatch, then the underside and the coordination of the two. I detail my solution, and he offers paper and quill so that I can sketch my design. He takes the finished sketch, tilts his head this way and that to mimic its use, and replaces it on the table. Very well, Dr. Constable, I believe you. The story you tell is too real and complex for it to be a screen for some other purpose. Please forgive our hard treatment of your injured body, but perhaps there will be compensation in the thought that our suspicions helped to save your life. I had not realized that my body was so tightly coiled until it eases on the utterance of those words. I do not have to mention my attachment to Helen as a further reason for connection to Morton and the probing into her background. Despite his acceptance of my story, I do not have a sense that my position is fully secured with Walsingham. Nevertheless, I must ask a question that nags my thoughts. It was a great surprise to see Master Baskin tortured and killed. From my earlier knowledge he had no leanings towards Rome and possessed a balanced temperament. How were you convinced that he had turned to wicked Catholic treason? He puts down his dagger and raises his eyes. <laughs> ha! It is a wonder you return to the subject of Baskin and his Jesuit associates. His mind was distracted by a woman. His wife was secretly devoted to the Catholic cause. <laughs>